Jesus has given us a gift, and we receive the gift of God in uh, Pastor Mark. So would you please give him a really good welcome this morning? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor David. I love you, man. Praise the Lord. Y'all can sit down. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. We're happy to be back here after taking a, a two-year break, and uh, but we're glad to be back, right? And I, I see some people still taking a break. But anyway, uh, we're <laughs> all right, did y'all hear about this guy, this guy that walked into this uh, country cafe, walked into a country cafe, probably in Texas, and they said, so what is your special today? And they said, well, my special today is cow tongue. Oh, he said, cow tongue. He said, that sounds nasty. He said, you think I'm going to eat anything that came out of no nasty cow's mouth? He said, no. He said, give me some of them eggs. <laughs> All right. <so laughs> uh. All right. I'll explain it to you later if you want. Uh. Wasn't that better than Pastor Mac's joke? I mean, Pastor Mac's joke, man. Boo, I mean, his joke. All right, now, did you hear about that duck? That duck walked into a bar, and he said, you got any lunch? And the bartender said, no, we don't serve lunch here. This is a bar. We only serve drinks. So he walked out. Next day, he walked back in the same bar. He said, got any lunch? The bartender said, no, I told you yesterday, this is a bar. We don't serve lunch. We only serve drinks. So the duck walked out, and he walked back in the next day, same bar, said, you got any lunch? Bartender said, no, I told you the last, this third time, I told you we don't serve lunch. Oh, we're a bar, we only serve drinks. He said, and if you come back in here again, I'm going to nail your little web feet to this bar. Next day, the duck walked in the same bar and said, you got any nails? <laughs> Bartender said, nope. He said, well, you got any lunch? <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's even that one's better than. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord! All right, open your Bible, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse thirteen. Wow, man, we are happy to be here. We thank Pastor David and Vicky. Uh, they're just two of the best pastors that we know. Amen. They're just wonderful pastors and friends and. So we're always blessed to be around them. We're always blessed to come back to this church. And I'm glad to have some other pastors joining us for the leadership meeting. And uh, I'm not sure what's on the wall over there, but we might have to take authority over it. <laughs> Did y'all have that up while Pastor Mac was talking? I mean, like, obviously he couldn't take authority over it. Y'all need to... <laughs> I'm like, man, I was at a church in Florida. They're probably watching, but good church, good friends. But uh, they had, you know, just got one of those big screens on the platform. How, how come you don't have one of those, David? You don't have no big screen on the platform? How come you don't have no big screen on it? It's like that. Yeah, but you got to have one of those big ones, you know, like a big tall one. Anyway, everybody's getting one. So, uh um, Hit, Pastor Mac don't have one either. You know when the big screens right there they have right on there? So that's all the young, oh, I see it, the younger people are getting those. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I was trying to preach and I turned around to look, see what the sound guys, you know, controlling. And they had like a, a weird looking psychedelic picture on there that looked like an uh, octopus with two eyeballs and the legs coming out and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't finish preaching until I said, you take that down right now in the name of Jesus. I let no octopus stare at me while I'm preaching. All right. So <laughs> where'd you get that from anyhow? Psychedelic stuff. All right. So now, <clears throat> y'all turn your Bible, 2 Corinthians 4, 13 this morning. We're going to talk about the spirit of faith. Woo, we get this term directly from the Apostle Paul. Woo, praise the Lord. Paul says this in Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written. He says, I believed and therefore have I spoken. He said, we also believe and therefore speak. So if you ask the Apostle Paul, what is it that you have 
that keeps you from collapsing in all the adversity that you have gone through. Now, if you want to study somebody that's had some adversity, if you think you got trouble, just read about the Apostle Paul and you'll say, I don't have no trouble. <laughs> and so the, the kind of trouble he had, he lists all the different kinds of trouble and problems that he had, adversity that he had. And so what kept him from collapsing, what kept him from quitting? Paul says, I'll tell you what I got. And I'll tell you what not only I have, but anybody that hangs out with me, what we have is the same spirit of faith. The same spirit of faith. So now the principles of faith are taught and they must be taught, but the spirit of faith is caught, or you could say it is contagious. The spirit of faith changes your attitude, the way that you think. Spirit of faith even changes the sound in your voice. Let's try that one more time. I said the spirit of faith takes the whine out of your voice. Come on, takes the victim out of your voice. Amen, and puts faith and puts victory in your voice. Amen. And so Paul says that's what we have. We have the same spirit of faith. Number one, it keeps us from collapsing because our faith is in God. Amen. Our faith is in the Word of God. So number one, it keeps us from collapsing. Number two, if you ask the Apostle Paul, what is it that made you so productive as a preacher or as a Christian or as a believer because he was the most productive Christian that ever lived. All right, let's try that one more time. The most productive preacher that ever lived, the most productive Christian that ever lived, what is it that makes you so productive? Well, let's go over it again. He said, I'll tell you what I have. Not necessarily the smartest, not necessarily the most talented, not necessarily the best looking, Not without trouble, but I tell you what I have. I have the same spirit of faith. That's what I have. Well, first of all, you can see that the spirit of faith sets you free from a spirit of fear or from being intimidated. Spirit of fear, being, being afraid of uh, circumstances or afraid of people. The apostle Paul was absolutely fearless. All right, let's try that one more time. Absolutely fearless. <laughs> and so one of my favorite quotes comes from the psalmist David, which Paul really was quoting from David. And he said, um, though the earth would be removed, I would not fear. <laughs> so, so I thought that's, that's pretty amazing if you got up the morning and the whole earth was removed and you said, well, I ain't scared. Let me go get another cup of coffee. So... To be free from fear, and there's at least, I guess, uh, I, I had a list of 125 different kinds of fears. You can find all of them in the book, Spirit of Faith, and it lists all the fears that, that people have, and uh, fear of dogs from one, fear of uh, enclosed uh, places, fear of elevators, uh, fear of getting married, uh, fear... <laughs> Fear of staying single, fear, fear of uh, getting peanut butter stuck to the top of your mouth. It's a real fear. They have a name for it. Fear of spiders. They got the fear of spiders. <laughs> fear of dogs. I, I had that when I used to deliver papers. Fear of dogs. Man, them dogs would come out and start barking. Man, you could just imagine yourself getting eaten by a dog. And found out one of them uh, actually didn't even have no teeth later, so that set me free from that fear. But I know he couldn't gum me to death. So fear, all kinds of fears. Fear of rejection. Come on, fear of lack. So the spirit of faith, first of all, just sets you totally free from fear. I'm free from fear. Boy, and I tell you what, if you watch the news long enough, Oh, come on, you watch the news, watch the bad news long enough. Man, I'm telling you, all kinds of anxiety and worry and fear can come. But when you have the same spirit of faith, whoo, come on, you are free from fear. I'm amen, free from sickness, free from disease, whatever name they give. God, they give that disease a name, at least it's not yours. But they will give you one if they come up with one. You have a unique one. <laughs> you say, I'm free. Hallelujah. Woo, amen. Man, I was in the, um, well, like a Walgreens or something, and they had the little spots you're supposed to stand on. 
And um, I got off my spot, boy, and there's a woman in front, ahead of me, man. That just shook her up, man. She turned around and looked at me, and I could tell fear came all over. She's like, oh, oh, oh. She's like, that. I said, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I wasn't watching my spot on the floor. I said, but you might actually want to catch what I got. I am contagious, and I've got a spirit of faith, amen, and that'll set you free from that fear. Now, fear has the power to produce the thing that you're afraid of. And so when Paul says we have the same spirit of faith, he said it involves two things. Number one, believe we are believers. And then number two, it involves your speaking or your voice. So apparently if you're silent, you cannot maintain a spirit of faith. Paul says, I believe and I speak. Even the devil don't care what you believe if you are quiet about it. Come on, people have all kinds of belief systems, but they don't ever speak. And when you speak the word or you speak what you believe, then that's what Paul calls the spirit of faith. Amen? The spirit of faith. So Paul said that's what we have. That's what we have, and it does what? Keeps us from collapsing, number one. Number two, what does it do? Makes us productive. Uh, so uh, there's actually three kinds of people. And they are pioneers, settlers, and museum keepers. Museum keepers are those who are content to dust off the memories of the past. Settlers are people who just find their comfort zone and looking for a rocking chair to stay in their comfort zone and relax. The spirit of faith is a pioneer spirit. A pioneer spirit is one who is constantly pressing for new territory. And a pioneer spirit is one who prepares the way for others who will follow. So that's the leadership. The spirit of faith, number one, is I'm constantly pressing for new territory. Well, that sounds like Paul, doesn't it? He said, one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind, and I'm pressing for those things that are just ahead. That, to me, would mean your best blessings hadn't even happened yet. Your best miracles have not happened yet. Come on, the best sermons have not been preached yet. Churches, best churches have not been built yet. In other words, you live in a constant expectation, pressing for those things that are ahead. Amen? Amen. That's a spirit of faith. That means you have an expectation something good is on the way coming to you. Now, this spirit of faith, David had it when he was 17 years old. Y'all still with me here? I said, David had it when he was how old? 17. She can't be too young. I would say Jesus had it when he was 12 and was in the temple teaching everybody. His mama had to go find him. So Jesus had it, David had it at 17, and Joshua and Caleb had it at 80 years old. All right, let's try that one more time. David had it at 17, Joshua and Caleb at 80 years old. Come on, they weren't looking for their comfort zone. They weren't just going to dust off the memories of the past. They're pressing on for some new territory. We're going into some new territory. Give us this mountain. We are well able to take it. We are well able. Boy, that's a spirit of faith, isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. And so with a spirit of faith, it makes you contagious. People catch it from you. Amen. You certainly don't want to catch what they got. Amen. <laughs> so you, your spirit of faith, number one, affects your attitude affects your thinking, and then it affects what? Your speaking are your voice. So the pioneer spirit is a spirit of faith that you're pressing for new territory. Illustration that I always use, 1947, uh, Chuck Yeager was the first man to fly supersonic, break the sound barrier, which is approximately 700 miles an hour. First man to break that. So when I, I saw that, I started watching this uh, history about Chuck Yeager, and then I got his personal book and read about what happened, the experience that he went through, and, and the disadvantage he was at on the day that he broke the sound barrier because they'd been trying to do it, you know, for, for months. Because if you don't break the sound barrier, you ca cannot uh, take, uh, send anybody to the moon. It's going to affect uh, your military. It's going to affect everything. So right after World War II, who's, who's going to make it to the moon first? 
Who's going to develop the technology to do that, to fly that kind of speed, have jets that go that fast? Whoever does will maintain the freedom of the world. So America, amen, the home of the brave. Am I in the right place? I thought I was in Romania for a second. I said, oh, Mother Ray, the land of the free. And so 1947, um, uh, they were trying to get guys, you know, they had the test pilots, and, and most of the test pilots were afraid to even try it. All right, let's try it one more time. I said, most of the test pilots were afraid to even try it because they called that sound barrier the great unknown and they had different theories about what a different scientist. Y'all have heard of scientists, hadn't you? And so they had different scientists that anybody goes that fast, you know, a, a plane will fall apart, they'll disintegrate. So all the scientists got all of their opinions. So they tried to find somebody that'd do it. And so one of the, one of the uh, test pilots said, well, I'll do it, but you have to give me a, a what was it, a $100,000 bonus. Well, back in those days, they're only making $400 a month, something like that. And so he wanted a big bonus just to take the risk. Chuck Yeager, he stepped up and said, I'll do it. They said, how much we got to pay? He said, nothing, you're already paying me, I'll be fine. <laughs> so they got, they'd take him up about 40,000 feet and drop him off in the X-1 rocket. Um, what what do you call that? Uh, Glamorous Glennis was the name of that. And so had that on the side, that was his wife's name, in case you're wondering. And so they dropped him off, <laughs> detached from the bigger jet, dropped him 40,000 feet, he fired up. Uh, that X-1 rocket, man, and uh, he'd get up there, you know, 600, and that thing would start rattling and shaking so hard uh, that he would have to uh, turn around, land, and then they'd make adjustments on the aircraft, then he'd try it again, rattle so bad, and he thought he was going to fall apart, make adjustments, make adjustments on the jet again. But the day that he broke the sound barrier, that day he had been out riding his horse the day before, got thrown off his horse, broke his ribs. And so when he went to get into the, 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 the rocket, I mean, uh, he couldn't even close the hatch or the door because his ribs were broken. So he had a guy cut off a broom handle so that he'd be able to pry the door shut without telling anybody that he had broken his ribs. And on that day, well, I like that story. On that day, he said, man, he took off and uh, got up 600, got right up close to 700, and things started rattling just a little bit. And he said, but today we're going to break this barrier. So he said, just pull back just a little bit on the throttle. And he said, boom, he went over uh, Mach 1, went over 700 miles an hour, and he said, oh, we're flying supersonic. What happens on the ground? On the ground, there's a sonic boom for the first time, unless Elijah did that when he was out running the king's chariot. But for the first time, there was a sonic boom. <laughs> so the boom made everybody on the ground do, do what? They thought another test pilot bit the dust. You know, another guy's dead. So, so they just thought, well, uh, you know, he's dead. So who's going to go tell the family, you know, tell his wife? And so, uh, uh, but while they were fixing to go tell his wife, then they look up in the sky and here's Chuck flying, <laughs> he's flying around, and he comes in for a landing. They say, well, what happened? Well, that was a sonic boom. You never heard that before. Uh, first man to break the sound barrier, first man to go 700 miles an hour. Wow. So they said, well, what was that like? He said it was like sipping lemonade on the front porch. <laughs> he said it was smoother than a baby's bottom. He said, it was the easiest thing. He said, because I realized the real barrier was not in the sky. The real barrier was in our knowledge of supersonic flight. Hmm. A lot of times we think something's our barrier that is not our real barrier. He said, the real barrier was in our knowledge of supersonic flight because after he broke Mach 1, it wasn't just a few months later, and he went Mach 2. All right, let me just talk to you for a minute. I'm on the devil will rattle you and shake you all kinds of ways when you're believing to break some barriers and go into some new territory and receive things from God and let God use you in ways you've never been used before and you're full of fear and anxiety. But you say, but I believe God. I have a spirit of faith. Come on, I'm not afraid to even give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. And, uh, and, and rattling and shaking because once you break Mach 1, Let's try that again. I mean, come on. 
Once you break Mach 1, it won't be long. You'll be at Mach 2. So I don't know what barriers you are facing. They may be financial. They may be physical. They may be mental or emotional. But when you have a spirit of faith, you believe and you speak and God's preparing you to go into some new places you've never been before. Amen. And you got to work on number one. I'm a believer. Work on your attitude. Come on. Nobody else is in charge of your attitude, but you are. Amen. Psalmist David had to talk to himself about his attitude. I love the story about our friend from Australia, you know, that says he's a billionaire, but he said he had a sign on his desk in his office that said, you got 10 seconds to get enthusiastic or get out of my office. Well, apparently he had some people working for him that every time they came into his office, they're whining or complaining or talking about some challenge or talking about some problem. And finally he said, I'm just tired of everybody coming here just talking about all the problems. He said, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to get enthusiastic or get out of my office. Well, if you knew you was going to get fired, you'd start finding something to get enthusiastic about, wouldn't you? Well, I thought, well, if he had that sign, I wonder, I wonder what kind of sign God has up in his office in heaven when you come walking in there and God says, you got 10 seconds to act like I'm God or you need to get out of my office. In other words, quit, quit acting like your problem's God. Come on, quit acting like all the circumstances are the biggest thing in your life. And start acting like your faith in God's the biggest thing. If you can believe all things are possible to him that believes, we're just looking for some believers around here. Amen. The spirit of faith, I believe. I believe. And in leadership, you will have to work on your own attitude. Let's try that one more time. People say, well, I'm going to move. I'm tired of things around here. No matter where you go, you're going to have to take yourself with you. So <clears throat> we have found the problem here. <laughs> Oh, years ago, I told the story about the guy. While he was asleep, they put Limburger cheese underneath his nose. Well, I don't know if y'all know what that is, but when, when we were like in Boy Scouts, you know, Raw Rangers, and always be some kid to go to sleep before everybody else did while you're out camping, you know. So we'd always, get, you know, get some mustard or something like that and just put it on his face and his nose and his mouth. And, boy, he'd wake up and the fight was on. Uh, when I was in uh, Bible college, we had a friend, you know, we had a few experiences with some friends. <laughs> I don't know if you'd call them friends. And I don't know why I've never heard from them again, but we had a few experiences. <clears throat> I won't tell you all of them, but anyway, this one, <laughs> this guy got married. And so uh, we, we got some tinfoil and put some Limburger cheese in it, put it on his exhaust manifold uh, on his car. So while he's on his honeymoon, <laughs> Man, the smell is going to be coming out of there. Limburger cheese is the worst smell in the world. So when he got back, we said, so how was it? He said, well, I don't know, man. He said, I, I, there was a terrible smell. He said, I, I know I must have passed them chicken farms all the way through Arkansas, but that's the worst smell I ever smelled in my life. So he said, well, we put uh, Limburger cheese there. And, uh, so this guy was asleep. <clears throat> While he was asleep, he got some Limburger cheese and put it underneath his nose. Directly he woke up. He's like, man, it stinks in here. He got up, went out of the bedroom, <laughs> went into the kitchen. He said, man, it stinks in here. Went out of the kitchen, went into the living room. He went, man, it stinks in here. So he walked out on the front porch and looked up the sky and he went, man, the whole world stinks. <laughs> the moral of the story is anytime it stinks everywhere you go. Ah, uh, come on, you get our stinks around there. It stinks. Well, we have found out where the stinks coming from. It's coming from your own attitude. Amen. And so you're going to have to change your attitude as a believer and talk to yourself. That's what David did. He talked to himself. He looked in the mirror and said, my soul, I'm talking to you. So you need to look in the mirror sometimes and talk to yourself and say, ah, I'm getting a little tired of your attitude. I know I am, but I'm just saying, uh, other people are tired of it. But you need to look in the mirror and say, I'm getting a little tired of your attitude. <laughs> and then say, don't look down while I'm talking to you. 
So you talk to yourself. And first of all, the spirit of faith is something you have and you know you got it. All right, let's try that one more time. This is not going to be an accident. I love what Brother Copeland said about Oral Roberts. He said Oral Roberts was the first man he ever met that used his faith on purpose. Okay, let's just try that again. In other words, faith is not just something, you know, when we get to heaven and we know that we're saved. He said he's the first man ever, man, that used his faith on purpose. Man, what would that be like every day just to use your faith on purpose? Amen. Living by faith, the spirit of faith that I believe and I say, or I believe and I speak and I believe God, amen, Paul shows you that in the book of Acts when he's in the middle of a storm, a 14-day storm, middle of the 11th day, and uh, said, no, it's actually the third day, had 11 more days left. <laughs> I mean, a storm, any kind of storm, can really get you messed up in your brain. What did Paul do during his storm? He just said, uh, everybody cheer up. He said, I believe God. What happened? He said, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. You said, but that was an angel. Well, we've got us in the, <laughs> the word. It says the word of God is more sure than the word of an angel. Yeah. Amen. said, don't be afraid. Fear not. I believe God. It shall be even as he told me. All right, let's try that one more time. Everybody cheer up. I believe God. It shall be even as he told me. Imagine that one man with the spirit of faith affected the life of every person on that ship. Praise the Lord. Amen. So he says, I believe, I have, that's what we have, the same spirit of faith. Now, when you talk about the spirit of faith, wow. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you, we learn so much from, from Dad Hagen that you just can't help but he talk about faith and quote him. And... Um, when Dad Hagen was talking about the seven incurable diseases that he had, you know, and he got a hold of, uh, you know, the New Testament and the Gospel of Mark, said while he was uh, reading that, he thought, well, I'm going to believe God and I'm going to live, you know, and, and I'm going to live and live well. And, but he got no results. And so uh, he's wondering why he wasn't getting any results. So he told the Lord, he said, Lord, I'm not getting any results. I'm not, believing, I'm not receiving the things I've been believing for. Mountains are not moving. I've got the same situation. And he said, Lord, if you told me the, re perp the reason is is because I don't believe, I would say, Lord Jesus, you know that's not the truth. I do believe. And if you told me that the problem was I didn't believe, then I'd tell you that you're wrong about that. How many of y'all have the nerve to tell the Lord he's wrong about something? How many of y'all want to tell the Lord sometimes he's wrong about something? <laughs> Well, because sometimes by your results, you kind of won't do. You're like, so I'm not getting any results out of that word. So he said, I'd just say, uh, you're wrong about that, Lord. And he said, the Lord Jesus said to him, you do believe as far as you know. All right, let's just try this out over here. You do believe as far as you know. In other words, you cannot believe beyond your personal knowledge of the word of God. Amen, because that's where faith comes from. So if you're going to believe and go further in your faith, then there's going to have to be a breakthrough in revelation knowledge because you do believe as far as you know. Huh. All right, so go to Ephesians chapter 1 because uh, the spirit of faith must operate off of the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Amen. Amen. Now, I tell you that I've used the illustration many times. It's one of my favorites about our little grandson, Gavin. And uh, we have eight grandkids, and we love all of them. Uh, we have a few more experiences with different ones, you know. But Gavin, uh, uh, we took him swimming lessons because they have a swimming pool in the backyard. And um, we've got not on the swimming pool there, but we actually uh, put a, a protective fence around it and also put uh, child protection there so that they can't open the gate unless they're tall enough to reach it. And so we got that. And then we got dead bolts on all the back doors, right? But that's not enough for me. That means I want to make sure all them grandkids can swim at the earliest possible age. By the earliest possible age, I mean 
young, two, three years old. And so I told my, my kids, I said, now I pay for all grandkids swimming lessons. And, uh, but I will personally see if they can swim after the lessons. All right, so I'm going to pay for all of them, uh, but I will test all of them. Well, the way our swimming pool goes, uh, Trina designed it. I don't know if there's any other design just like it, but she did it, uh, she did it just for the grandkids. It goes, what, maybe uh, six inches of water. Come on, then it goes down to maybe a, a foot, two feet, three feet, and then go down. So the grandkids could play, you know, even in six inches of water. And the mamas, you know, they can lay out there. But, but here the grandkids, uh, every once in a while, right, you're trying to one or two, they'd get up and start waddling around until they get out over their head. So you have to rescue them, you know, but they could play right up there uh, about four or five, six feet, and they could play. And then it goes down to the deep end. Then it turns and goes down to the diving board, which is the deep end down there. All right, so we give them all swimming lessons. Well, I happen to be standing out by the pool, and here come the grandkids come over to visit. Well, the first thing they want to do is they want to go swimming. So I'm standing out there, happen to be standing by the deep end, little Gavin. He comes running back because he all poppy, poppy, poppy. And so his daddy came with him. We're standing at the end, and he said, poppy, poppy. He said, he said, I can swim now. I can swim. Well, I'd been watching him. I knew he couldn't swim. I said, oh, you're swimming now. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm a good swimmer, poppy. Oh, I said, you know, he was so excited, probably three years old, something like that. Oh, I can swim now, Poppy, I can swim. And then his daddy walked up at the same time and said, that's right, Poppy. I'm telling you that, Gavin, he's a swimming dude, man. He can swim. And he was so excited three years, I can swim, I can swim. Then his daddy said, ah, he can swim. I, but I knew he couldn't swim. I watched him. He could only swim in the shallow end, which ain't swimming. Shallow end, that means he can walk, you know, get out, and he can, but he can't swim. So, standing right there at the deep end, and the, my son-in-law, I thought, you know, I ain't going to argue with him. I'm not going to argue. My point is to take him back to lessons. Well, but he can swim, right? Okay, well, we ain't arguing about it. So, we stand at the deep end, so I just grabbed little Gavin like this and just do dropped him right into the deep end. His daddy looked a little surprised. I thought, well, what you upset about it? You told me you can swim. I mean, this is, this is the swimming area right here. <laughs> His eyes got wide, you know. So uh, we watched Gavin from the side of the pool, and, you know, we could, we could see him uh, sinking. <laughs> so he's sinking. And uh, while he was sinking, I noticed his little hands and, and his little hands and little feet, and he, was, he, and, and he was making swimming motions, but he's still sinking. So I turned to his daddy. I said, now, if I was you, I would jump in there and save my kid. For my kid, I'd jump in there and save. Y'all know I got a little attitude, right? So, you know, you're the smart one. Said he can swim. I know he can't swim, but we ain't gonna argue. So we'll prove it to you. He can't swim. So he gives me his wallet, and he gives me his phone with his clothes. <laughs> he jumps in there and pulls Gavin out. Well, as soon as he gets Gavin out, he's not hurt or nothing. He just got a, a little understanding that he wasn't as smart as he thought he was. How many of you ever had that happen in your life? And so, so uh, when he got him out. <laughs> I said, now nah, I told you he can't swim. Now you send him back to swimming lessons and there will be another test. <laughs> Happens in church every Sunday. When people come in, I got faith, I got faith, Pastor, I got faith. I'm telling you, I got faith. Oh, well, you're doing the shallow end. Come on, while well, you can touch bottom and you're jumping around down there. Come on, but you let the problems of life throw you in a deep end. And some of y'all be making some faith motions, but you're still sinking. 
Ah, uh, come on. I said, you making faith motions, you're still sinking. Come on. And yet you sit there in church while somebody trying to teach you on faith and say, I know that point and I got that point. Well, read it on the bottom of the pool. Listen, because you're sinking all the way down. So unless there's a breakthrough in your revelation knowledge, unless something happens in your believer, woo come on, something's gonna have to happen in your believer because the next time you hit the deep water like that, come on, you better be ready to swim now and don't even act surprised about it. <laughs> woo Amen. All right, so now the spirit of faith, I believe and I speak. And Dad Hagen, the Lord told him, you do have faith as far as you what? Wow. So Dad Hagen said, I realize that I'd have to get further light and further revelation for my faith to work in this situation. All right, let's try. I feel like slapping somebody right now. He said, I said, I'd have to have some further light Come on, and further revelation. Come on, because if you ain't getting no results, you're still sinking. Well, faith wasn't designed for you to sink. God didn't design faith. Say, all right, well, it'll work sometimes, but sometimes you're just going to sink. <laughs> God designed your faith for you to swim. Hallelujah. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Come on, and the storms of life come to all of us, but when you have faith in God, when that storm's over, you're still standing and you're praising God. Come on, you say, look what the Lord has done. Amen. So we're not saying you won't have any storms in life. Actually, the Lord said to me, he said, your faith may not prevent all mountains, but it will move all mountains. All right, let's try this out over here. Come on. In other words, you can't say, well, how come I had the mountain? He said, well, it may not prevent it, but it will move it. I said, your faith will move it. I said, your faith will move it. I said, your faith will move it. So instead of wondering how it got there, come on, just start talking to it and say, you're going to have to move. Woo. All right, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Praise the Lord. Because we're going to have to have our faith has to be loaded with what? Revelation knowledge. Amen. Further light. You say, what's going to happen when I get a little further light? You're going to make a few adjustments on your jet. <laughs> Woo, come on. Y'all get happy in here. I said, you're going to have to make a few adjustments on your jet. Amen, because it's designed to break that barrier. And the problem is once you break that barrier, come on, you're headed for Mach 2 now. may look impossible, but I believe and I speak. Hallelujah. I'm going to some new territory. I'm talking about 2021 right now. I'm talking about the next 12 months in your life. I'm planning on seeing some new scenery. I'm planning on going to some new territory. I have a spirit of faith. Amen. I have a spirit of faith. You say, how long you got to keep that? Well, at least to 80. Come on, and then I noticed Brother Copeland going on the Victory, Victory Network when he was past 80 and made the biggest step and the greatest influence of the whole life in ministry after he was 80 years old. And you was tired at 65. <laughs> you was trying to figure out where you're going to get your rocking chair from, your comfort zone. No, when you have a spirit of faith, you're going to have to go on. Move on. You say, well, well what if other people don't go? Well, I'd say Goodbye. Amen? All right, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's pray this prayer because this is where Dad Hagen, we talk about a breakthrough in knowledge, a revelation, understand. So here's, what, here's the prayer he told us to pray. <laughs> Ephesians 1, y'all know it, huh? What, what are we asking God for? Father God, this is a prayer by the Apostle Paul for believers, even for spirit-filled believers. And Dad Hagen told us, I was just a teenager when I remember him saying it. He said, pray the Ephesians 1 prayer. And he said, pray it every day, preferably more than once a day. Don't miss a day for at least six months. Well, I was only 17 years old. So if I'm going to do that, then I put the King James Version on one side of a card, put the Amplified Bible on the other side of the card, carried my back pocket. I had an Afro hairdo. Bell bottom blue jeans. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Pull that card out. 
Father God, this is what I'm asking you for. So I'm not going to miss a day, and I'm going to do it at least at least twice a day, morning and evening, because I'm, I'm serious. Because Dad Hank said, if you, if you just keep skipping days, you're not serious. It ain't going to work for you. I said, well, we're going to do it. Now, amazing, amazingly enough how easy this information is and this instruction is that I have people work on my staff that heard me teach on this for 10 years. And I'm paying them from my faith. I'm paying them, and I know I'm dragging them because they ain't helping. They found out later when they got to get on their own faith while they were sinking. On my staff, ten years, and would not do the instruction that I told them for ten years to pray that prayer every day. Don't miss a day for at least six months. Are y'all still here? So this is not really just a sermon. This is like instructions. So I said, all right, let's get it down. I wrote the first side, then I wrote second down Amplified Bible. Father God, this is what I'm asking you for. This is what I'm asking you for. Woo, y'all ready for this? This is what I'm asking you for. Come on, this is instructions from the Holy Spirit. This is what I'm asking you for. And apparently God really likes it if you ask him for it. And since it's a progressive thing, the more, is that you? Hello? Hello? Joe Biden. <laughs> you know they have a nickname for you now. All right, let's keep going. So <laughs> we're praying for you right now, President. Now, specifically for this. <laughs> Once a day from the nursing home. All right, so now. All right. <laughs> I really did that just to make sure all y'all would come back in and start paying attention again. I usually do that when, when people are not paying attention. <laughs> That's what happened to Ronald Reagan. He's giving a speech one time. <laughs> and he said something like this, Ronald Reagan. He's one of our favorite presidents. He said, our, our liberal friends, he said, um, I'm not saying that they're ignorant. He said, I'm just saying there's so much of what they know that just ain't so. <laughs> All right, let's keep going here so y'all don't get too disturbed. All right, so, so let's just say this about some of the other church friends. We're not saying they're ignorant. Just so much of what they know just ain't so. In other words, we want to know what's going to work. Amen? So back to Ephesians chapter 1. Father God, this is what I'm asking for. I'm asking you that you would give unto me personally, personally, come on, the spirit of wisdom. Wow. Now, look here. The spirit of faith is going to come from this spirit of wisdom. That you would give unto me the spirit of wisdom. Well, if you could have it at 17, David must have known something that the rest of the soldiers didn't know when he ran at Goliath. He ain't no stronger. He just knew something. <laughs> the king saw, even though he was taller than everybody else, David knew something the rest of them didn't know. When he faced Goliath, what did he know? He knew he had a covenant with God. Are y'all still here? All right, go back here. Spirit of faith is going to come from where? The spirit of wisdom and revelation. Father God, I'm asking you, give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in what? In the knowledge of God. Whoa, what's going to happen? The eyes of my understanding will be flooded with light. 
that I may know what is the hope of your calling and what is the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints and what is exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe according to the working of your mighty power which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at your own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also and that which is to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that fills all in all wow think about that the authority that you and I have as believers and he says that you would see that that you would know that for yourself that means this Paul's revelation was not some exclusive thing because he was an apostle. Paul said, every believer can see and know the same thing that I see and that I know. How are you going to get it? Father God, this is what I'm asking you every day for the next six months. Amen. And since it's progressive, I said it's progressive. Come on now, we used to pray and hear Dad Hagen praying in these prayer meetings in the mornings, and he'd say, oh, Lord, we know so little. Well, I thought if he knows so little, we know almost nothing. So I'm just saying, listen, if he said he knows so little, imagine what must be available to us as believers to see and to know. Amen. Woo. Come on, Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, it says, Moses laid his hands on Joshua, and the spirit of wisdom came on him. Woo, let's try that again. Come on. We used to go to Dad Hagen's meetings. I'd stick my head out there, you know, and I'd try to get up as close as I could just so he could just tap me in the, on the head, slap you on the head. What happened? Well, there's anointing, first of all. There's blessing, but also one time he slapped me on the head and he said, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, bam, hit me in the head. All right, now here, my friend Charles Cowan. Let me tell you this. I'll close in just a minute. My friend, Pastor Charles Cowan, Nashville, we love him. He's a great, great pastor, great friend of ours. So he's telling me his experience. First time he went to hear Brother Kenneth Copeland, and he's spirit-filled, believer, went to hear him, went to hear Brother Copeland. I don't know where it was, probably somewhere in Nashville around there. He went to hear Brother Copeland. Brother Copeland preaching, Charles said, I sat there and I said, that's the most arrogant, cocky, smart aleck preacher I've ever heard in my life. So he said, I got up to, to leave. He said, and the Lord arrested me and said, you sit down and listen to him, and you'll find out some things you don't know. So he said, I held on to my chair and sat there and listened. He said, and after a while, I started thinking, wow, well, I'm starting to get some understanding here. Some revelation, some knowledge. Wow. Well, it changed his whole life. Come on, end up going to Ramah. Study under Kenneth Hagin, changed his whole life. But listen close. So I was talking to Brother Copeland <laughs> years ago. I said, you know, Brother Charles Cowan? Oh, yeah. I said, did you know he said the first time he heard you preach? <laughs> Charles said, thanks for telling him, Pastor Mark. I said, did you know the first time he, he heard you preach, he said, that's the most arrogant, cocky, smart old preacher I've ever heard. And uh, I didn't get to finish. And Brother Copeland kind of jumped in. He said, oh, that's just because he never heard anybody preach with a spirit of faith before. Are y'all still here? Come on, what did they accuse David of when he said, I'll kill the giant? They said, oh, you're a smart aleck. Who do you think you are? David said, well, I can tell you who my God is. I can tell you that. 
Amen. Come on, I'm telling you, it'll take the whine out of your voice. You'll sound different even to other Christians when you have a spirit of faith. There'll be a boldness and a confidence because you're washed in the blood. Your faith is in the blood. You're redeemed by that blood. Come on, the word of God cannot fail you. You've got the indwelling Holy Ghost living on the inside of you and God's given you exactly what you've been praying for. He's given you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that you'll be filled with the knowledge of his will with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. you walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Come on, strengthen with all might by his spirit in your inner man. In other words, he's saying that God will give you a breakthrough in your understanding. Come on, I believe God can give you a breakthrough in your understanding. Woo! You say, oh, that's how that works. So I go here, Brother Hagen. Of course, I started listening when I was 17. And I got to where I thought I knew it pretty well. I could kind of finish the stories and all that. I went to Bible college. They called me Mark Hagen. I went to Assembly of God Bible College. So they kind of considered it an insult. I considered it a compliment. I said, well, thank you. So, <laughs> so I'd gather some in my room, you know, and talk about faith and how faith works. So I thought, man, I'm, I'm going pretty good here. And boy, I was getting some good results. So I went to hear Brother Hagen in Tulsa one time. It was another church there. And that's I was probably 22 or something like that. Brother Hagen started teaching on faith. I started looking around. I'm going, I'm sure glad all these people are here listening to this. It's sure going to help them a lot. I'm so glad they're hearing this. How many know the Lord knows what you're thinking? Yeah, even today. I said, the Lord knows what you're thinking. Jesus used to actually teach and answer their thoughts. <laughs> oh, y'all ought to go ahead and laugh. I said, Jesus knows what you're thinking. So I was thinking, oh, that's good stuff. I, I, I'm sure glad I already know that. I can swim. You know, I can swim. <laughs> And the Lord just spoke real clear to me. He said, I know what you're thinking. You think you already know this. He said, if you would humble yourself, he said, I'll show you some things about faith you have never seen before in your life. Boy, I just started repenting. Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. I don't know near as much as I think I know. Please forgive me. I know you could show me some things about faith that I could make just a few adjustments. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. I, I could make just a few adjustments. And if I can make those adjustments, I can break that barrier. I think you should laugh about that. I said, if I can break that barrier, Mach 1, come on, I can go to Mach 2. In other words, I'm a believer. I believe and I speak. I have a spirit of faith, and that spirit of faith is fueled by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Let's try it again. I said the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He said the real barrier was not in the sky. It was in our knowledge of supersonic flight. Come on, God will teach you how to break some barriers. Woo, in a lot of areas. Let's try that again. I said a lot of areas, not just one or two areas. We can break some barriers in a lot of areas. Wow. God can take us into some new territory. How'd you like to laugh about that? Amen. And Wigglesworth said, <laughs> Wigglesworth said, faith laughs at impossibility. I kind of like to look at things that are impossible and just say, well, let's just laugh about that. Come on, go ahead and pick out a few things that look like, I don't know. I, I, come uh, on. It may be a few people you know. It's like you say, I don't know if they ever going to change. I don't know. Come on, maybe your finances. Uh, you'll never, I don't know. Maybe your health. Uh, spirit of faith will have you laughing. Oh. All right, just pick out one or two things, whatever you can think of right now. And just uh, laugh at it. Just go, ha, oh. ha. 
Uh, Y'all can't even do that in church when I'm telling you. I don't know how you're going to act at the house. (laughs) Come on, this is your support group here. We won't tell nobody how you acted. (laughs) Stand up on your feet, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, have faith in God, amen. I have the same spirit of faith. Everybody say, I have. have. We have have. the same same. identical Identical. spirit of faith. faith. Same thing. Same Same thing Paul had. Same thing Joshua and Caleb had. Same thing David had. I have the same thing. I believe. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. I believe and I speak. I will not be silent. I lift my voice, God's word in my mouth. I believe and I speak and mountains have to be removed. I'm gonna break some barriers. I'm gonna go into some new territory. Matter of fact, I got 10 seconds to get enthusiastic about it and act like God is working in my situation. I got 10 seconds to believe God can take me someplace I ain't never been before and I can receive things I've never had before. God, God can use me in ways I ain't never been used before. 